uh, functions are objects studied in calculus. I can write better on white word or black word, uh, but I think I'm getting better to write on, on computer screen. The slogan I want you to remember, okay? Uh, and then on the screen, you have the definition of functions. Again, functions are objects studied in this course. We are going to learn how to differentiate functions, how to integrate functions, uh, how to take limits of functions, and uh, everything is about functions. Actually, functions are models describing some na uh, the relations between quantities in nature. Okay. You will learn that. I am not going to make too many comments. Uh, I just uh, make some comments on the mathemat mathematical definition of functions. Okay. The definition is on the screen. Uh, that's kind of official definition. But uh, now I'm going to give you an intuitive way to define functions. So later on, we're going to use the intuitive way to introduce many other concepts. Okay. Okay. The definition of functions, I'm going to call that informal. I will make some comments on that using some particular functions. Okay, you just copy it down first. A function is a machine satisfying some properties. Actually, there is only one condition. Only one condition. You treat a function as a machine. A, a machine can take inputs, right, and. Uh, produce outputs. You treat a function as a machine such that such that part is the condition. There's only one condition required for the machine. Uh, such that every input has a unique output. Unique by unique, we mean one and only one. I think I can write one and only one. Every input has one and only one output. Can I just say unique has a unique? Unique is, is kind of a formal wording in math, has a unique output. By that, we mean uh, one input cannot have more than one output. The output has to be one and only one. Okay. okay, I will use a particular function to show you the meaning. Uh, so how about we use a particular function like this to show the meaning. So now let's do uh, The commonly used notation for a function is f, f for functions. Okay. Now let's say the function, I'm going to show you the meaning in my definition, the informal definition using the following function, the function is square root of x, square root of x. This is the notation of the function, okay? And then I'm going to use this notation to introduce some terms, okay? Okay, now you have a machine. The machine is a function. The machine is a function, okay? Uh, I'm going to put the, the function in the box. You imagine the box is a machine. The machine can take inputs and uh, produces output, right? Okay, so now let's say under the function, uh, uh, I will give you some inputs. You, you tell me output, okay? I will show my message and uh, you can write your answers in the message. So where's my message? It's here. Okay, cool. Okay. Now let's say if I, I give you an input of one, so do you want to tell me the output? And by the way, the notation is kind of standard. Uh, 
this one is the input. If I give you x value, x value is a input, right? If I give you the input of one, and then the output you get is is denoted using that notation. So this notation is the va uh, you call this notation the value of the function at one, or you just say f of one. I think you know this. You know this. Uh, if again, if the input is one, the output is f of one. It means the output for the input of one is computed using using square root of one. I give you the solution to to the first case. Square root of one is equal to one, of course, right? I was trying to say if the input if the input is one, the output is also one, right? The output is one. Okay. Uh, now I'm looking for the answers to my next question. If I give you the input is zero, you want to tell me the output? So please, you can write your answer in the message, please. You can write your answer in the meeting chat. Meeting chat, please. I know not many of you guys have been using Teams, but. Uh, Zero, yeah, yeah, yeah. Zero is right. Okay, uh, you just tell me one one single number is right. Okay, uh, one single. Uh, if the input is zero, then the output is zero. Zero is coming from square root of zero. You do not have to write the full details. I give you the full full details on the first line, and then I I will ask you some more questions. Okay, uh, if, if I give you the input of four, if the input is four, what is the output? So just tell me a number. Just tell me the a number, please. If the input is four, the output is two, of course. Right? Uh, two is coming from square root of four. And by the way, uh, do not give me two numbers. Uh, do not give me plus or minus two. Okay. Uh, the requirement is that, okay, a, a common mistake. The meaning of that notation is to take the positive root. Is to take the positive root of four. The meaning of this notation is the po positive root of four, so you have two. Okay, it's uh, anyway. In terms of the definition, a uh, one input cannot have two outputs anyway, right? And uh, one other way to see that, uh, I'm trying to say. I think uh, in a interview of a sessional instructor at the college. I have seen some guy, so, so give me something like this, so which is not good. So yeah, this is not true. Okay, it's not the same thing as solving a equation like this. If I want you to solve a equation x squared, so equals four, you give me two two numbers. The solution to that is the solution to the equation. The equation has two solutions. The solution would be x equals plus or minus four. Okay. Uh, I mean plus or minus two, of course. Sorry. The the two situations are different. I think you know what I mean. Okay. Okay. I will I will give you another input. You tell me output. So what is the output for the input of of ninety one? For this function, what is the input for the output of ninety one? No output. Yeah, probably you want to tell me no output. But uh, what is the proper term if uh, there's no output? No output. This is the case. Uh, we cannot take square root of a negative number. I'm trying to say this thing is not defined in the in the in the context of of real numbers. So in this case, we just say uh, f of ninety one is undefined. A proper term is undefined. Okay. Now, for instance, to compute square root square root of of ninety one, you think what number squared is equal to ninety one, right? The, this question mark is is not defined. No number squared is ninety one. Every number squared is positive is a positive number or zero, right? The official answer is 
and the value of the function at negative one is undefined. Or we can say negative one is using my term using the informal definition. Negative one is a bad input. Intuitively, informal, okay, informal name, a bad input. Okay. okay. <laughs> And likewise, likewise, uh, if I'm looking for the the output for the input of so now now let's say so ninety one point five is also a bad input. So basically, any bad in, any negative number is bad input. Okay, now I'm going to give you more definitions. We're going to introduce more definitions, okay. For any function, the bottom line is to know how to evaluate the functions. Now, for instance, uh, when getting the output, when getting the output, in, in this course, we do not use a long notation. We just say, now let's say, for the first line, we just say the f of 1 is equal to 1. So that notation is sufficient. So because if you you have this notation, you see the input. This number is the input, right? And then after being pro processed by the function, the output is one. You see the notation for the function. You see the input. You see the output, right? And likewise, uh, f of zero is equal to zero. You see the input. You see the notation of the function. You see output. Okay. Again, the whole thing. I'm going to repeat the terms over and over again. We say the uh, we say the value of the function at one is one, or you can just say f of one is one, f of one equals one, f of one is equal to one, all the same thing, right? For any function, the bottom line is to know how the function is defined. By that we mean, uh, I give you inputs, how you get outputs. Or alternat alternat alternatively, we say uh, how to evaluate the functions. How to evaluate the functions. That's the definition of functions. Okay. The bottom line is the first thing you need to know is how the functions are defined. By that, we mean how if you can evaluate the function at different numbers. I will get, give you one other definition, okay? Uh, an important definition. Uh, not, now we are going to define what we mean by the domain of the function, okay? Can I just write the definition? Domain. Okay, the domain of the function, the domain of a function, so copy down the definition, okay. I'm going to make some comments. The domain of a function is a set, is a collection. I was trying to say the same thing in two ways. A set is a collection, is the set consisting, consisting of all qualified inputs. By that we mean, uh, you think for what values of x you can evaluate the function. I want to repeat, by that we mean for what values of the f uh, for what x values you can evaluate the function okay. okay now for example for example we still use the function we just talk about we just talk about okay the function we have been talking about uh, uh, is the function defined as square root of x Maybe for this function. Now, 
now let's now let's go back to that screen. Okay. Okay, it's possible to evaluate the function at zero. It's it's possible to evaluate the function at one. It's possible to evaluate the function at four. It's it's not possible to evaluate the function at, at negative one. Negative one is a bad input, right? Now to get the domain, you think for what values of x we can evaluate the function. Anybody want to give me a description of the domain? You can evaluate the function at one. It means one is in the domain. You can evaluate the function at zero. It means zero is in the domain, right? The domain is a collection of numbers. You can evaluate the function at four. It means four is in the domain. You cannot evaluate the function at negative one. Negative one is not in the domain. You cannot evaluate the function at, at negative two. Negative two is not in the domain. You cannot evaluate the function at negative zero point one. Negative zero point one is not in the domain. So for you miss one number. Yeah, bigger than or equal to zero is good. Bigger than or equal to zero is good. Okay. Uh, greater than than zero is almost right, but uh, zero is in the domain. Okay. Uh, bigger than or, or equal to zero is good. If you give me a description, we can just say it's the set or the collection of all the non-negative numbers. I said non-negative numbers. Okay. I will write that down on next slide. For this function, again, to to get the domain, you think it's possible to evaluate the function at what numbers, at what x values. All such numbers will form a domain. Okay. Again, so zero is uh, okay, I will write something on scratch paper. Zero in the domain, one is in the domain, right? Uh, you put all these all these numbers together, all the qualified inputs together. And that's why I said the domain is the set consisting of all qualified inputs, right? I think I think you got the idea. Okay, for this function, uh, if I I'm looking for a description in words, you say the domain. is the set consisting of all non-negative numbers, right? Non-negative numbers. And of course, the description is not unique. You can also say all the numbers greater than or equal to zero. The same thing, right? So later on, we are going to introduce uh, some some notations called the interval notation to denote to represent the set consisting of uh, all the non non negative numbers and so on. Okay, but uh, now I want to move on to to the next definition. Now you know the most important thing is to know how the function is. Is defined by that we mean how to evaluate the function at different numbers, like to compute f of one, f of zero. Uh, if I, I'm looking for f of of ninety one, it's undefined and so on, right? And then the second thing related to the function is the domain of the function. By that we mean uh, the collection of all the qualified inputs. You get rid of all the bad bad inputs, and then you have the domain, right? And then we talk about how to how to graph the function. And in many cases, uh, graphing a function is important, so you can visualize many properties of a function. Okay. Now we are talking about how to graph a function right now. Okay. Actually, to graph a function, you just you just remember one thing. You just remember one thing. To graph a function, you just remember one thing. The one thing I want you to to remember is that each value of the function determines a point on the graph. I'm going to write it down. Okay. Each value of a function. So 
or maybe of the function. Now we're talking about the dot function. Actually, okay, a function is okay. We can talk about uh, any any function, right? To graph a function, you remember each value of a function determines determines a point on the on the graph. Okay, add something. Uh, it's not the official of official definition of the graph. Uh, so can I add remember? So just remember each value of a function determines a point on the graph. As long as, as you can you can remember that, then we know how to get the graph of the function. Okay. I will make my point using the function we are talking about. Okay. Now for example I know how to write the example. It's, it's ugly. For example, okay, so maybe for the function we are talking about for the machine we are talking about now uh, the function square root of x. I think we have seen a few values of the function, right? Uh, so we have seen, so maybe we have seen The value of the function at zero is equal to zero. Okay, the value of the function at one equals one. We have seen that, right? The value of the function at two equals four. I think it, you can list man, many, many more, right? What a nonsense! Sorry. The value of the function at uh, at four is two. You take square root of four. It's equal to two. Okay, we have seen a few values, so maybe we'll get one more. Okay. The value of the function at 9 equals 3, right? You take square root of 9, you have 3. And of course, the function is defined at uh, any uh, non negative real number. You can also compute the value of the function at 2. You have the answer square root of 2. So later on, I think in the next class, you are going to see some weird numbers like the e. Yeah, probably you learned pi before. Okay, so these are all the numbers studied in this course. These are all real numbers, I'm trying to say. Okay. But now I'm making my point now. Okay. Each value of the function determines a point on the graph. Now for instance, the value of the function at zero is equal to zero. You use the input as x coordinate and you use the output as y coordinate. Each value of the function determines a point this value, can I see the cursor? So the, this value determines a point with x coordinate of zero and the y coordinate of zero. Again, x coordinate is coming from the input, y coordinate is coming from the output. Each value of the function determines a point on the graph. The second value, the value of the function at one is equal to one. It determines a point with x coordinate of. It, this one is coming from the input. This one is coming from the output. So likewise, this value determines a point on the graph with x coordinate of four and the y coordinate of two. The last value determines of. Not the last value. I should not have said said the last value. Too many values, right? Anyway, you have a uh, this value determines a point on the graph with x coordinate of nine and y coordinate of three. You know that, right? And then uh, there are many inputs. Inputs you can take zero, you can take one point one, you can take pi, you can take e, you can take any real number, right? Uh, actually, you can take any non-negative real number. So that correspondingly, each real number determines a point. Many real number will determine many points, and then you, many such points, will form a curve. This curve is called the graph of the function. Okay. 
I think uh, you you were told to memorize the graph of, of many functions already, okay, in high school. But uh, I'm going to make my points. Each value of the function determines a point on the graph. Okay, uh, zero zero. Point zero zero is here. I'm just going to make them bold. Okay, so now let's say one is here. So one is here, right? The origin is here. So do not forget the terms. Uh, the point of intersection of two axes is called the origin. Horizontal axis is x-axis, right? Vertical axis is the y-axis. So that's yeah, that's a term. So that's how we communicate. Uh, this point, the origin is on the curve, and the point one one is on the curve, right? And the uh, four two is on the curve. So now let's say four is here, two is here, four two and is on the curve. And then 9, 3 is on the curve. 9, 3 is probably far away somewhere here. Okay. Again, each point, uh, each value of the function determines a point. Uh, in the domain, you have many x values. Many x values will determine many points. You connect all such points. You have a graph, right? You have a curve. This curve is called the graph of the function. I told you uh, functions are objects studied in calculus. Uh, at least we need to know many properties of the function at elementary level, uh, at high school level, or however, however, however you say it. Okay. okay, so that is the graph of the function. Okay. Any questions so far? Easy. I think you learned everything. I'm, ju I'm just trying to summarize many properties using a vertical V. So can I say vertical V? Later on, <laughs> okay. I will tell you later. Uh, we have seen how to define function. By that we mean we we have seen how to evaluate the function. Evaluation is is essentially how the function is defined. And then we have, I have told you the meaning of the domain of the function. I have told you how to graph the function, sketch the graph of the function. Lastly, the last thing you need to know is the range of the function. Okay, I'm going to give you a definition. Now we're going to define what we mean by the range of a function. Okay. So don't worry, you don't have too many things to memorize. Uh, after that, then we're going to talk about the more more functions for the for the four things: evaluation, the domain, the graph, and the range. Okay. The last definition is the the range. Okay. Now copy this down. Okay. The range of a function. It's also a collection, a set. It's a set consisting of all possible outputs. Uh, it's not very strict, but uh, you can also imagine the the range uh, is is the collection of all the y values. I think people, students, say that way. In many cases, it's it's, uh, it's super easy to identify the range using the graph of a function. Yeah, that's why I put the definition of the range after the graph. In most cases, after you, you have the graph of the function, it's easy to identify the range. You just take all the points on the graph into account. You consider all the points on the graph. And then you think, what are all the y values of the points? What are all the, all the y coordinates of the point uh, on the graph? 
what are all the y coordinates of the points on the graph. Yeah, that's what I meant. Anybody want to tell me the range? The range, give me a description of the range for this function, for this function. For square root of x, what is the range of the function? You can write the answer on the in the meeting chat, or you can speak up. What is the range of the function, please? The range of the function? Yeah, greater than or equal to zero. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's right. Equal or bigger than zero. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right too. Yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, so you know the meaning of the range, right? You know the meaning of the range. Again, by definition, the range is the set consisting of all the possible outputs using by definition in terms of inputs and outputs. Okay. Okay, I'm going to write it down. Okay. Now, for example, I think in some way uh, the meeting chat is better for the people who don't want to speak up in class. Uh, you could always write in the chat. It, it's also good if you speak up. Okay, you do not have to raise your hand in my class. You don't need to raise your hand before speaking up. Uh, now, for example, the range of the function we are talking about now. Actually, I'm going to use a simple function to motivate many definitions. And then we use the definitions to apply to to many other functions. That's the whole thing. So the range of the function uh, of that is uh, you told me the set consisting of all the real numbers greater than or equal to to zero. Actually, in high school you learned how to use uh, inequality. I said inequality. In high school, you learned how to use a inequality. Ah. Sorry, I'm still learning my pen. Uh, that's actually. Uh, the range of of this function is. Uh, can you use a notation you learned in high school? I think one of you guys wrote wrote something in the in the message, so which is good. Okay. Uh, using inequality, you say something like uh, it's the y value greater than or equal to zero, right? Actually, more more precisely, we need to use a site builder notation. Doing something like this, so very shortly, you are going to see uh, we are going to use this notation to define some other things. This notation. I will tell you the meaning. This notation is called the site builder notation. I will, t I will read you the meaning of the notation. Now you look at the mouse cursor. This notation is the site builder notation. It means the site consists consists of all the values of y, all the real numbers, the real numbers are denoted by y, such that uh, after this semicolon, after this colon, I think we call that colon, after the colon, uh, after the colon, you have the condition. The condition is the condition on y. I'm going to re redo this again. The meaning of the set is the set consists of all the y values satisfying the condition that, or you can say such that, such that, y is greater than or equal to zero. The same thing. I think you in high school you just learned to represent the range, range using that. It doesn't matter. I said it doesn't matter. Uh, actually, it matters now. So very shortly, I will show you how to represent the, uh, the domain and the range. Okay.
Okay, I just told you at a high school level to understand the, a function, I want you to be able to answer four questions. One question is how to evaluate a function. By that we mean how the function is defined. I give you inputs, how you can get the outputs, right? The second question you need to be able to answer is the domain of the function. Again, by definition, the domain of a function is a set consisting of all qualified inputs. It probably is the set. A function has only one, one domain. And then you are given a function, you need to be able to sketch the graph of the function. The graph of the function will show you many properties. Lastly, you need to be able to get the range of the function. Okay, I want you to now I want you to open your handout. Handout number one, please. We're on the journey to study these functions now. Uh, for all the functions, uh, you see on the top, I have four questions. Evaluate the function, get the domain of the function, graph the function, get the range of the function. Uh, now, for, now we are going to talk about, uh, actually within two weeks, within two weeks, we are going to, it's kind of review your high school stuff. I told you functions are objects studied in calculus. If you look at the handout, handout one, on this list you have uh, six, six classes of functions. These functions are the building blocks. I said the building blocks we need in this course. We're going to go over all these functions one tap, one by one. Tap by tap, okay. It's getting more and more scary. The first class, constant functions, and then power functions, exponential functions, log functions, trig functions, all the, and then inverse trig functions. All these functions are required. I, know how, I don't know how many classes uh, you missed in high school, but uh, uh, yeah, probably you you learn some trigonometry. Uh, you did not cover inverse functions, inverse tricks. So that's what I I know from people in past years. Uh, for inverse trig functions, we'll talk about that class in more details. For all other class, I'm going to review all other classes in some detail. Okay. Again, all these classes are the building blocks of the functions we 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 need in the course, okay. And then after this, we are going to learn how to build the functions we need, how to build the functions we need. Uh, by building, we are going to perform some operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, of course. And uh, more importantly, composition. Using these operations, we can build all the functions we need in this course. Now let's say you are given two numbers. Now let's say uh, a, a and b. A is, is less than b for any two numbers. A, a, a less than b. Okay. If you do not like abstract numbers, you can imagine a is 1, b is 3. It doesn't matter. The same thing. Okay given two numbers, one number is less than the other one. We are going to define a few types of intervals. The first type is called open intervals. Okay. Open interval. Should I write the term? I'm going to write open interval. Okay. Open interval. The notation is round bracket, 
round brackets. Inside the round brackets, you write a comma b, a comma b. Interval notations. So that's a interval notation. The meaning of this notation, I'm going to use the set builder notation to give you the definition. I'm trying to see if I I turn on the microphone. The interval notation, okay. This is a notation called open interval. It represents a set consisting of some numbers. I will use the set builder notation to define open interval. It's a set consisting of all the all the real numbers. I'm going to use x to denote the real numbers. It's a set consisting of all the real numbers such that or satisfying that satisfying the condition that yeah the same thing okay the number is greater than a strictly strictly greater than a at the lesson b to understand the open interval i'm going to ask you a few questions so maybe on next slide, and then you tell me the answer. As long as you can answer the questions properly, then you know the meaning. You should be able to know the meaning. Okay. Okay. And now let's say we can define an open interval from two to four. Okay. That's an open interval. The notation of the interval notation is the collection of all the real numbers satisfying the condition that the number is greater than a and less than b the number is greater than 2 and less than 4 now remember to use round brackets for open intervals use a comma to separate the two numbers okay now try to answer my question okay try to answer my question is 3 in the interval is 3 in the interval by that we mean is 3 a number greater than 2 and less than 4? Yes, 3 is in the interval, right? 3 is in the interval. We use a notation like this to denote 3 is in the interval. I know this topic this topic is not in high school math, but we, we need interval notations. Okay. We use a notation like that, now look at the cursor, to denote 3 is in the interval. Okay, is pi in the interval? Is pi in the interval? Uh, you recall the meaning of pi. Pi is a, a, a real number. Approximate value of pi is 3.14. Right, is pi in the interval? For that we mean it's uh, it's a non non repeating non repeating infinite decimal. Okay, and yeah, that's why I wrote uh, approximated by this number. Now try again. Is pi in between two and four? Pi is in the interval, right? Pi is in the interval. Pi is three point something. It's in between two and four, of course. So pi is in the interval. Again, we use a notation like this to denote pi is in that interval. Okay. Now, a little, a little weird question: Is two in the interval? Is two in the interval? I will put a question mark down. Two is not in the interval. Okay. So because the interval is, uh, the interval consists of all the numbers. Uh, strictly greater than two and, uh, and and less than four. Now look at the definition here. Greater than a and less than b. By that we mean two is not greater than two, right? Two is equal to two. So two is not in the interval. Okay. And then we use a notation like this to denote two is not in the interval. This is in something. Uh, uh, a member is in a set. Okay. That's the notation you just say in or belongs to. Two belongs to the interval. Okay. If you want to say two is not in the interval, you use a notation like this to denote two is not in the interval. Okay. 
So that makes sense. It's not like an equal notation as that. So not equal is that, right? It's comparable to, to that notation. The so two is not in the interval, now let's say from two to four. Uh, the full name for the interval is the open interval from two to four. Two is not in the open interval from two to four. Okay. okay. It's uh, one in the interval. Of course, one is not in the interval, right? One is not in the in interval. So this is the interval notation again for all the numbers greater than greater than two and uh, and less than four. It's comparable to in high school you learn a inequality. A inequality is something like this. Now let's say when talking about the, the domain you, you use x. Uh, x is greater than two and less than four. But we just put all such numbers together. We form a set. So this is a set notation a interval notation denoting a set consisting of all such numbers. I hope I hope I made it clear. Okay. I just told you the meaning of open interval. Secondly we are going to define uh closed interval. Closed, I said closed interval. A closed interval, the notation is something like this. Instead, instead of using round brackets, you use square brackets. Can I call this kind of brackets square brackets? Okay. I think you can guess the meaning already. Uh, if you are given, uh, so you imagine a value is two, b value is four. Okay. On two sides, you have square brackets. This is defined as, that's also a set of all the real numbers. I'm going to write x. I'm going to use x to denote an arbitrary number in the interval. The property of x, x satisfies the condition that x is, this time you, you write greater than or equal to a and less than or equal to b. By that I mean a and b are included in the interval. So for open interval, A and B are not included. Any number in between is included. For closed interval, it means A and B are included. It means the two endpoints are included. I said endpoints. Two endpoints are included. I guess you know the meaning already. Uh, it's getting easier, I hope, right? Now let's still talk about uh, the closed interval from 2 to 4. Okay. If I replace the brackets with, with square brackets, now we are talking about a closed interval. A closed interval, okay. So so this time it's pi in the it's pi in the interval. It's pi in the closed interval from 2 to 4. Yes, right? Any number greater than or equal to 2 and less than or equal to 4 is it, is in the interval. Okay. So this time it's four in the interval. It's four in the interval. Yes, yes. Good. Four is in the closed interval in between from two to four. And by the way, uh, when we say the interval, when we describe the interval, we say the closed interval from two to four. From two to four. Now it's five in the in the closed interval? Is five in the closed interval? No, five is not in the closed interval interval, of course. Five five is greater than four, it's not less than four, right? Uh okay. I, I think you know what I mean. So this one is probably too simple for you guys already. Okay. Five is not in the in the closed interval from two to four. Okay. That's what I was trying to say. Okay, now we just define what we mean by a closed interval. Uh, as long as you can answer these questions properly, then probably you know you know the meaning. A interval can also be half open and half closed. Uh, I'm I'm not going to define them all, but uh, I just 
I just show you one case. I think you, I think you can guess the meaning already. Uh, now let's say when talking about this case, it's a interval half open and half closed. It means nothing but uh, it consists of all the numbers in between a and b, and together with the one endpoint, a is included, b is not included, right? If you want me to write the definition using the set builder notation, it it is a set consisting of all the real numbers having the condition that x is greater than or equal to a. a is included, right? Greater than or equal to a. Either or. And the less than b, right? Okay, I just uh, asked you one question. If you know how to answer the question, then you should be okay. Uh, so maybe, so this time I'm going to make uh, the left, the left hand side closed and the right hand side open. It's four in, it's four in, in the last interval. It's four in the last interval. Now you look at the cursor. It's four in that interval. No, four is not in that interval. Uh, four is not in that interval, I mean. Four is not in that interval. Is two in that interval? Is two in that interval? Yes, two is in that interval. As long as you know that, then you know the meaning of uh, half closed and half open, right? Okay. I think I'm going to define uh, one other type, then you should know the meaning of, of everything already. I think uh, for the function we mentioned square root of x, the domain you told me is the set consisting of all the non-negative real numbers, right? Positive numbers or greater than or equal to zero, however you describe it. Uh, we have a way to describe uh, all the real numbers like that, okay. Can I make the left font round? Yeah, the same thing. Actually the same thing. I will define one more tab, and then I, I believe after that you should be able to handle all intervals. Uh, the one more tab I'm going, I will define is something like this. Uh, I will make the interval not including the left end point A if you write an infinity here, so don't be scared of the infinity. This infinity is nothing infinity. It's a symb symbolic notation, okay? So this notation, it just means, it just means the set consisting of all the numbers satisfying the condition that the number is greater than A. That's the definition, and and by the way, uh, I'm not going to write the definition. We can also define a interval like this. So maybe I will give you the that the definition. Okay. Uh, the next one, I could also say a interval like this, from negative infinity to now let's say another number b. Yeah, this time I'm looking, I'm making the right the right hand side closed. I guess you know the meaning of this already. If using the set builder notation, it means the set consisting of all the real numbers such that the numbers are less than or equal to b. b is included it's because of the square bracket, right? And by the way, for the uh, for the interval notation, if uh, you see one side is either infinity or negative infinity, this side is always open. This side is always open. I'm trying to say a notation like this is uh, illegal. A notation like this is illegal. If you see one side is either infinity or negative infinity, on this side you always have a round bracket.
Okay, uh, to fully understand that, I will make up some questions to. If you can answer the following questions, then probably you should be okay. Okay. Now let's talk about the interval from zero to infinity. Zero to infinity. Okay. Okay. So now let's say it's uh, uh, the largest number I know. It's ten thousand. In that interval. It's ten thousand in that interval. Now let's recall the meaning. This is the interval consisting of all the numbers greater than zero. Right. This one is in that interval, right? Now let's say it's zero in that interval. It's zero in in the same interval. I will put a question mark here. Zero is not in that interval. Okay. Uh, so because the interval notation it means all the numbers greater than zero. Zero is equal to zero. Zero is not greater than than zero, right? I was trying to remove that. I know my pen has a eraser function, but I haven't figured it out. Uh, I knew it, but uh, I forgot. Okay, as long as you you know that, then then it's fine. Uh, so one more question. One more question. Is zero in the interval so something like this? Is now look at the cursor. Is that zero in this interval? So please, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so many years is in the chat. Okay, good. I think I think you got the idea. Okay. In the future, uh, for the domain and the, the range, you are required to write the domain and the range using the interval notation. You see, it's part of the requirement. Okay. Uh, write your answer as a interval. Write your answer to the domain and the range using a interval notation. Okay. Uh, so don't worry about uh, unions. Uh, so when we see when we see we need the unions, I'm going to talk about the unions. Okay. As a review class anyway. Okay. Now we are we can talk about uh, functions. We're going to talk about the building blocks one by one. And in any case, we call these building blocks. Uh, uh, it's kind of an official name when I did my university, but uh, now I don't. I don't see people using the term anymore. All these functions, all the building blocks, are called basic elementary functions. So I think we can still call them that. Basic elementary functions. These are the functions uh, on this list. On this list, it has uh, it consists of constant functions, power functions, exponential functions, logarithmic functions, trig functions, inverse trig functions. We're going to talk about this one by one. Okay. We start from constant functions. Represented by question one a, uh, as long as you know how to do question one a, then you should be able to do all constant functions. It's very simple. It's very simple. Actually, the simplest class of the functions, constant functions. Now, le now let's recall for any function, we I want you to be able to answer four questions. Evaluate the function, get the domain of the function, sketch the graph of the function, and then the range of the function. Okay. We'll go over this one by one. Constant functions. Uh, okay, now let's talk about uh, evaluation first. How to evaluate the function? I mean, okay. we talk about the value of the function at zero first. So can we talk about that first? Okay. I may not do the values in order. I know some people don't like that, but uh, I'm a little random in some cases. 
Okay, anybody want to tell me the value of the function as zero? If you know this value, then you know what we mean by constant function. Anybody want to tell me the value of the function as zero? A two, two is right. Two, two is right. Two is right. Constant function. Okay, you just imagine x can take any number. Uh, that's why we call it a constant function. It means the value of the function at any number is equal to the constant of two. So that makes sense. So the value of the function at zero is two. I know uh, it's always always the case for simple simple things. Uh, people are get confused. Yeah, it's okay to to get a little confused now. Uh, it's common. It's common. It's normal. So don't worry. Okay. Uh, I was asking you, so before I told you the meaning of the constant function. But again, the meaning of the constant function is uh, the value of the function at any number is equal to the constant of 2, no matter what the x value is. In particular, at x value of 0, you have the value, the function value is 2. Okay. And likewise, uh, the value of the function at 1, one more, is 2, right? It's 2 as well. And the value of the function at 2 is 2. The value of the function at any number is 2. Okay. The value of the function at negative 2 is, is 2. The value of the function at, at negative 1 is 2. Now I think I completed the, li the list. I could make the list uh, very, very long, but uh, I, think, I think you got the idea. Okay. So we have answered the first question. The first question is to know how to evaluate the function. It means how the function is defined. I told you the meaning of the function, right? The second thing is, uh, uh, in the second thing, we are going to get the domain of the function. The domain, now let's recall the definition. The domain is the set consisting of all possible inputs. You think, by that we mean, you think we can evaluate the function at what numbers? All such numbers will form the domain. 0 is in the domain because we can evaluate the function as 0. 1 is in the domain. Negative 2 is in the domain. Negative 1 is in the domain. Uh, how do you describe the, the domain, please? What's, what is the domain? You can tell me the answer using a description in words. Or you can tell me better using the interval notation. Inter uh, I, I forgot to tell you the interval notation. Probably you don't know the interval notation. So just tell me the description in words, please. All real numbers, all the real numbers is good. Okay, by that we mean uh, we can evaluate evaluate the function at any number. Okay, at zero, at one, at two, at any positive number, at negative two, at negative one, at any negative number, at zero. Right. Okay, uh, you told me the set of all the real numbers, uh, but uh, I forgot to tell you the the interval notation. I hope the interval notation for the set of all the real numbers will make sense. We use a notation like this to denote the collection, the set of all the real numbers. So that makes sense? Again, so this is the notation, the interval notation for the set of all the real numbers. You told me the domain is the set of all the real numbers, right? Using the, the interval notation, you, you use that. Okay. Uh, the third question, so do not forget do not forget what questions we need to answer. Okay. The third question is the range, uh, sorry, the graph, how to graph the function. I told you earlier, each value of the function determines the graph. Uh, if it, it was the real face-to-face -face class, I would ask people to wave their hands to, to tell me the graph. Anybody can give me a description of the graph? Tell me the shape of the graph, a description of the graph, please. A straight line is right. So how do you describe the straight line more precisely? Vertical, horizontal, slant. Horizontal line, right? Horizontal, yeah, yeah that's good. Okay, okay uh, again, 
I'm going to recall the basics. Uh, each value of the function determines a point on the graph. Uh, so you know this value uh, is not part of the solution. I'm going to write that on square paper, okay? Uh, the point with x coordinate x coordinate of zero, y coordinate of two is on the graph. The point with x coordinate x coordinate of one and y coordinate of two is on the graph. And so on, right? And then you connect all such points. I think you have a horizontal line. Horizontal line. Now let's say one is here. Uh, y is now let's say two is here. The horizontal line is that, right? Illustration only. Okay. And yeah, it's a little hard for me to draw graph on on computer screen. Illustration only. You see the graph. Uh, so we know how to evaluate the function, we know how the function is defined, we know the domain of the function, we know the graph of, of the function. Lastly, where I'm looking for the range of the function, okay? Anybody want to tell me the range of the function? The range of the function, please? The range of the function, the range is the set consisting of all the y values. Yeah, y equals 2 is, is good. But uh, in the question, we are trying to use uh, the interval notation for this for this one it's hard to use the interval notation we just use the site builder notation the site builder notation you enclose two in curved brackets you enclose two in curved brackets this is the site consisting of only one number the number is two I want to repeat on the screen you have on the screen, you have the set consisting of only one number. The number is two. So the range is the set consisting of only a single number. You see that from the graph, right? For all the points on the graph, all the y coordinate, all the y coordinate, for all the points on the graph, the y coordinate is the same, right? The range is the set consisting of all the, all the y values. The first class, we are done the first class. I think as long as you know one constant function, then you should, you should know all other constant functions. So I'm done the first class. Right. And then um, we'll move on to the next class, power functions, power functions. Okay, now you look at the screen. The definition is here. The definition is on the screen. On the screen, you have the definition of power functions. What do we mean by power functions? A function of this form or a function that can be converted to this form is called a power function. Okay. It's x to some constant power. x is the base. I will show you a particular con uh, power functions. I will show you a particular power functions. Okay. Now, for example, uh, the following functions. Are power functions. Okay, now let's now let's now let's start with the uh, the most common one, the the most common ones. I mean, okay. So now let's say x squared. You, I'm not using the function notation f of x. Okay. Anybody want to recall the graph of this function? You have learned that. Uh, you have seen that over and over again. Okay. That's a particular quadratic function. The graph of the function is a parabola, right? Now let's say x cubed. Actually, square root of x is also a particular power function. Now, now let's recall the definition. Now let's recall the definition. 
for the definition, any function that can be written uh, in the form of x to some power, x to, to some power, x to the power of n is a power function. So anybody want to tell me why this is a power function? This function can be rewritten in what form? As x to what power? Please. I'm looking for exponent. Uh, yeah, one half is right. X to the power of one half. You know that. Uh, if you don't know that, so don't worry. So later on, I will tell you some formulas, to, formulas to memorize. Okay. Okay. So now let's say uh, one over x, x, x cubed. One over x cubed is essentially a power function as well because it can be converted to the form of x to some power. Anybody want to tell me this is converted converted to x to what power? Answer my question, please. Uh, this is x, 1 over x to the power of 3 can be converted to x to x to the power of negative 3, right? For the people who forgot about this, so don't worry. I know, I remember, I know you learned that in pre in pre calculus eleven, right? With the int, probably. Okay, uh, if you forgot about this, it doesn't matter. I will tell you three three formulas to memorize. I'm going to copy the three formulas on PowerPoint. Uh, remember the formulas right now. Okay. If you forgot, you these three formulas. You just you just need to remember three formulas. These formulas are used to convert uh, some form of some forms of the functions including some radical functions to the form of the power functions okay I will show you I will show you a few examples how to use the formulas okay now for instance uh, if I want you to convert 1 over x cubed to the form of a, a power function you use the first formula this is the pr a particular case that m value is equal to 3 right you see this form is converted to the in terms of a power function, in the form of a power function as x to the power of, of negative 3. You look at the first formula, m, m value is, is 3, right? I will tell you how to use the second formula too, okay? I will write a particular example under the formula. So now let's say, if I want you to, to convert, now let's say cube root of x to the power of 5, this is a particular case when m value is 5, n value is equal to 3. You see that, right? So in, in the form of a power function, this is the same thing as x to the power of 5 over 3, right? Trust me, I'm teaching calculus. So later on, when differentiating or integrating functions, these conversions are going to be very, very useful. I will I will show you what one other case under the third formula. If I want you to convert the radical function, so now let's say uh, one over now let's say the third root of x to the power of five. You use the third formula. This is a particular case. M value is five. N value is three. So the form you convert that uh, to the form of a power function as negative. If you see the radical is on denominator, you have a negative sign in here, right? Exponent, I mean. You have negative m over n, so in this particular case, 5 over 3, right? Using the three formulas, you can handle probably all, all the cases, okay? 